Welcome back, everybody, to the afternoon session. I'm Matt Sinclair. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about how to use Gem5's GPU model. So um, you know, a couple disclaimers I want to get into just to address a couple common questions off the top. Right now, Gem5 only supports uh, AMD and ARM to a little bit, but mostly just AMD GPUs. The concepts are similar to other companies like NVIDIA, though. We're also going to talk about what you commonly will hear referred to as general purpose GPU or GPGPU workloads. So uh, as far as I know, there's no support right now for things like OpenGL or Vulkan. Uh, if you're trying to run true graphics workloads, we're not going to talk about that today. Uh, so and then uh, you know, I'm giving this talk, but there is a large, large number of people, both at Wisconsin and AMD Research and others uh, elsewhere, who uh, have done a lot of this work. One of them who you'll, you'll see helping me as we come around with examples is Marco, who's here in the audience with us. Marco, of course, is the one who wrote all this code, so he's the one who actually knows how it works. Um, in terms of getting set up, so a couple things we need to do because the GPU support behaves a little differently than what you've seen thus far. So number one, uh, a couple of you pointed out during lunch break, there was a, a problem with uh, a couple of the paths that didn't quite work, so please go ahead and run git stash, then git pull, and then git stash pop, and that should pull into your code space the fixes to those two problems that folks highlighted. Uh, and then when that's done, you can run, please run this docker pull command for the GPU models, as you'll hear me talk about in a few more slides. We use docker in particular to help compile the applications because of the complexity of AMD's software stack and getting that just right. We create Docker support to do that. And then lastly, uh, in case copying all these commands is hard, which I completely understand, all of these commands are in the readme file other than the git stash command. That is not uh, in, the, in the readme file. But every command you'll need to run all of the examples that we're going to go through in this session is right here. So you can see on line seven, we have the command to do the Docker pull that I just had on my slides. Let me show you all in the code space the other thing that you should see and also what to do if you don't see it. So the, um, in this Workspace 2024 folder, you should see a file both like this called x86 Ubuntu GPU ML Dot g isca dot gz and x86 ubuntu gpu ml isca. Some of you see both, and some of you, as I'm coming around, only see the gzipped one. So for those of you who don't see the non-gzipped one, I'm going to add one more command to this slide to have folks run. Because when we get to running the full system mode tests, it won't work if you don't have this. <laughs> So for those of you who do not have um, this x86 GPU Ubuntu ML ISCA without the gzip append at the end, you will need to run dot slash dot dev container slash post underscore start dot sh. And it should show up then. That post start will take about 10 minutes to run. So uh, that's great, because I'm going to spend some time now doing going through the basic background material, so you're going to hear me talk for a little bit before we get into examples. OK, so before I get into the details now, what I'm broadly going to do with the time this afternoon is the first half of the talk, I'm going to start from you know, the beginning, always a very good place to start, uh, and assume you don't know what GPUs are, in part because the feedback you all gave yesterday afternoon was that a lot of you have not seen GPUs in any way, shape, or form before. So I'm going to talk about that broadly. And then in the second half, we have a number of examples and demos about how to use the different features in Gem5's GPU model. But why do we care about this? Why is that important? Well, when it comes to getting your code to run efficiently, there's a fundamental trade-off between programmability and, efficiently. We can, and efficiency. We can think about that as being on two axes. On the y-axis, we have ease of programming. On the x-axis, we have hardware efficiency. And of course, ideally, it would be easy to program and super efficient. As you've heard Bobby and others talk about today, uh, 
those two things are not always uh, in agreement to them. So if we think about solutions, the single CPU out of order core, maybe it's a superscalar processor, as you heard Bobby talk about and Jason talk about, relatively speaking, those are easy to program. You write your software, the compiler will compile it down to run on x86 or whatever architecture that it's designed for, uh, and you don't have to make a ton of architecture-specific optimizations to get it to perform well. And even better, you can buy a new processor two, three years down the line, thanks to things like Moore's Law, and your code will get faster, even if you didn't make any changes. So that's why its ease of programming is very high, but it's hardware efficiency because it's trying to be the best of all worlds to every kind of program you might want to run. It is trying to be truly general purpose. That means that its hardware efficiency is not very good. On the other end of the spectrum, we have things like ASICs, where, you know, as some of you I know from talking to you have done, you design some hand-tuned ASIC specifically to perform some functionality, and for that functionality, its hardware efficiency is great. In fact, probably the best we could do or close to it. Programming them is usually not very fun, though. Usually it means writing hand-tuned assembly, if you're lucky. Or, you know, uh, maybe if it's an analog accelerator, you have to, you know, attach some wires to it or whatever it might be. So, opposite end of the spectrum. Somewhere in between, we have multi-core CPUs. If we have, say, four to 20 threads, now the free lunch is over. You have to actually write your CPU code to harness that parallelism. but you're gonna get better hardware efficiency than the single-threaded one, assuming you have parallelism in your code. And GPUs fall kind of somewhere on the other end of this curve. So we can have thousands or even millions or billions of threads running in parallel. So our hardware efficiency is gonna be better than those CPU-based solutions, but they're not gonna reach the level of an ASIC. And the cost of that, though, is that our programming for GPUs is gonna be harder than it is for a CPU, because we have to fundamentally think about thousands or millions of threads, whereas in the CPU, at most, you probably have like 64 threads. So that you have an order of magnitude or more things you have to think about happening concurrently than you do in the CPU world. And that tension, that trade-off, brings value here. It brings value in terms of efficiency, but it also takes away in the sense that writing code is now harder. And of course, ideally, we would like to get up here. So why accelerators then? Well, hardware acceleration in the modern day is everywhere. We have specialized chips for doing things like video and image encoding and decoding, cryptography, Bitcoin mining, genomics, database accelerators, network accelerators, and of course, machine learning accelerators in many, many different flavors. Uh, and so what that means is we're, we're in, you know, as Hennessy and Patterson called it, the second golden age of architecture where we can sort of design efficient hardware for lots of specific problems. So, Within that, though, the challenge is many of these accelerators, like the ASICs I mentioned on a couple slides ago, are generally not programmable. So they, may, they might have some custom knobs or configuration registers that allow you to sort of program them in some abstract sense, but they're not Turing complete. You're not gonna be able to run arbitrary code on them. Uh, and so what we're gonna focus on today is GPUs, which are a type of accelerator, but are an accelerator that you can run mostly arbitrary code on. So there's a, a distinction here, but it's an important one that I wanted to touch on up front. Um, secondary reason to think about why accelerators are becoming so prominent. Well, on the general purpose front, CMOS compute frequency has completely reached its limit. We do, you don't see Intel and AMD really scaling frequency anymore, which when I was uh, you know, an undergrad student was still a thing. We actually saw them you know, brag about running one, two, four gigahertz you know, uh, in preceding generations. Now they're pretty much all just four gigahertz and they're not getting any better. Instruction level parallelism, which is what CPUs use to exploit performance, and they do lots of things, as you heard other folks throughout this week talk about branch predictors and caches and a wide variety of other techniques to help. Um, they've done great things. There's not a ton more to get there in terms of performance, but also they are very energy hungry. For the time being though, although we'll see how long it lasts, we're still getting more transistors from Moore's Law, and we have been using those, for example, in NVIDIA GPUs to continue to make bigger uh, you know, designs with billions of transistors, teraflops of performance, and now almost or exceeding a terabyte of bandwidth per second. Um, 
And the reason why this has worked so well is that it turns out lots of workloads are highly parallel. Of course, machine learning is a prime example and one that lots of people have been utilizing in recent years. But you know, the reason why you should care about accelerators is this is really where the, the community is going, really where the future is going to be. So within that context, I think it's instructive to think about what was a GPU. Because you know, although machine learning has been around since at least the 1950s, it's only been really in the last 10 years, let's say, that machine learning and using accelerators for them has taken off. GPUs have been around since at least the 1980s, so you know, there's at least you know, 20, 30 years of history of them doing things that were not machine learning, which is what you hear about today. So GPU came about, it stands for Graphics Processing Unit. And originally it was designed to be an accelerator for raster-based graphics, so things like OpenGL or DirectX or Vulkan. Uh, and it, was high, it is and was highly programmable and could use commodity hardware. But the, the claim to fame for it is that it had, unlike a CPU, it was designed to run hundreds of ALUs in parallel concurrently and tens of thousands of threads running concurrently. So for example, that would allow you in gaming or other, you know, uh, in you know, Pixar and movies, for, in, for example, to take something like this robe and you could draw lots and lots of triangles to make up the sleeve of that robe. It turns out that each and every one of those triangles are essentially independent and that means this is a highly parallel operation, but to do it in parallel, we gotta also have a lot of memory bandwidth to bring in all of those triangles to work on them in parallel. So in the 1980s and 1990s, for example, uh, if you don't know, like Toy Story was you know, the most, one of the most famous examples here of a, a movie that came out that was entirely computer-based. If you've ever heard the folks from Pixar talk about what they did, they had giant fleets of CPUs with GPUs attached to them running rasterization for all of the pictures and the images in that uh, movie. And that has continued on to today in, you know, depending on your point of view, bigger and maybe better, you know, newer ways. So why is that useful? Why would we consider using GPUs for computing? Because originally they were just designed for graphics. Well, it turns out the way that GPUs were designed, they use a larger fraction of a given area for computation than a CPU does. And that means because they have more area dedicated to doing computation, if you can design your code to take advantage of it, you can have your program run with an order of magnitude less energy per operation than a CPU. Uh, of course, these pictures are not drawn perfectly to scale, but the basic idea remains. There is you know, this one little itsy bitsy, not so you know, insignificant caveat though. It also means you have to rewrite your code which is a non-trivial fact, but the fact that you could get an order of magnitude better energy and get better performance meant that programmers were willing to you know, beat their head against the wall and figure out how to write program for GPUs because, programs for GPUs because they could harness this and get better efficiency. Of course, that is a big caveat though. I mentioned it on the previous slide you have to have an application that can actually utilize those resources, or otherwise you're kind of out of luck. Modern day, let's you know, flash forward from the 1990s to today. GPUs today are now ubiquitous. Um, they're not just used for graphics anymore, although that is a, a, you know, a, a prominent thing that they still do if you talk to you know, AMD and NVIDIA and ARM and Samsung and so on. But they really have had this huge rise in the past decade because of machine learning, which has been their new killer application. It turns out crypto, uh, Bitcoin mining is also a killer application, uh, which, uh, you know, another disclaimer, we will not be teaching you how to run crypto in Gem5, so if you're hoping for that, uh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, generally speaking, the NSF and other funding agencies frown upon uh, doing that kind of thing, but if you would like to do it on your own time, so be it. What does that all mean though? Well, now we're running lots of different kinds of workloads on GPUs. We're not just running them for graphics and rendering images, say, for a video game or for a movie. So the name GPU is not really meaningful. In reality today, what they are is they're highly parallel, highly programmable vector supercomputers. So you heard Jason in the last session with Bobby talking about how we've implemented RISC-V vectors and x86 vectors and these other things in Gem5. GPUs take that concept and apply it 
to the nth degree. So they're running huge vectors in parallel concurrently across lots and lots of data. And that allows them to get this efficiency and benefits from the fact that we have applications that utilize them. In fact, uh, a friend of mine at a, a company that I won't name, uh, I think I cut this slide out so hopefully I don't tell the joke twice, he once referred to uh, machine learning as the manna sent from heaven for GPUs. So, you know, you can also, if you want, you can go look at NVIDIA's stock price and you can basically figure out when they started realizing machine learning was, uh, was something they should invest in. I don't know if you were still there uh, at NVIDIA at this time, but there's a famous story that Jensen went to a, a machine learning, Jensen's the CEO of NVIDIA, he went to a machine learning conference and he sent his, uh, his next level reports of email that the whole email just said swarm machine learning. And that was in about 2015, maybe a little bit before. So. What are we gonna to do today, given that context? Well, by the end of this session, you should be able to understand the basics of GPU architecture and programming, understand the basics of how we implement those ideas in GEM5. We will show you how to compile the GEM5 GPU model, including what we use Docker for, which you all pulled already. You'll be able to see what resources we already have available for you if you want to avail yourself of them. And then we're gonna run some tests and some examples using both SE and FS mode, including being able to do checkpointing and restoration in FS mode so you can run certain things like MNIST or like Nano GPT, depending on how far we get in the GPU model today. Which, is, by the way, this is all in the public code. This is all open source. There's nothing you, know, you all are getting that you cannot do in the public code today. It's just uh, you know, hopefully by showing you all how to do it, you'll be able to benefit it from it sooner. Okay, so like I said, the first half of this talk is gonna be me giving that background because I know not everybody has seen GPUs before. Then we'll talk about how Gem5 models and uses them, and then we'll get to some examples. In terms of parallelism, you heard me reference this a couple times before, but there's a number of different ways that processors will exploit parallelism. Instruction level parallelism is very popular in CPUs, and the idea here is you have different instructions, assembly or machine code instructions usually, that are running in the same thread, but can be executed in parallel without affecting the correctness of your program. Uh, and that is exactly what Intel and AMD and ARM and others have been exploiting for 30 years now. Task level parallelism, the idea there is well, maybe within one task, I don't have a lot of things I can do in parallel, but I can run many tasks in parallel at the same time. And this is what Microsoft and Google and other companies do. They run all of those different queries when we take a picture at, at a restaurant, ask it to translate a menu for us or a thousand other things. They're running each and every one of our requests concurrently in the cloud to try and figure out what we want, but to get efficiency, they can run many of them concurrently. At a low level, in languages like Verilog and VHDL, you can run bits for a given computation in parallel. For, and this is where things like longer words or carry lookhead adders are, are providing some parallelism. And then last but not least, in terms of what I'm gonna discuss today, we have data level parallelism. And what data level parallelism does is it exploits this idea that we're really doing the same computation uh, across many different threads, but we're doing it on different data for each of those threads. So for example, I could have thread A and thread B, let's say they both wanna do an add, but each of them wants to do an add on a different address from memory. Well, I can load in those addresses concurrently, and then I can add them concurrently. And this is where a variety of flavors of data level parallelism, such as single instruction multiple data, or SIMD, there's also single instruction multiple thread, or SIMT, which is what GPUs do, as well as single program multiple data are exploiting parallelism. And what they're really doing here is they're saying either in the case of SPIMD applications or in the case of SIMD or SIMT instructions or threads can operate on those concurrent instructions that are identical. So that means they save cost on things like fetching and decoding because they only need to fetch and decode an instruction once across many threads and then they get different data for them in parallel and do the adds or the multiplies or whatever operation you might wanna do concurrently from there. There's also about 10 other flavors of parallelism that I did not show here. Uh, 
But the key point I hope you take from this is that GPUs are designed to exploit data level parallelism, or DLP. You might be wondering why. Well, I just gave you a hint, right, when it comes to fetching and decoding and the efficiency we get there. But it's also easy to build efficient hardware that can capture this because it turns out that computation that uses this kind of parallelism tends to be very regular. And this means we can reduce the logic we need for fetching and decoding or controlling things like branches and so on, which allows us to instead invest those resources in things like having more memory bandwidth or having more ALUs on our processor. So what does that mean? Well, I, I think an instructive way to think about this is to think about it with some threads. Now, I just want to be clear, while I'm using like four threads here, in reality, real machines are using tens of thousands or millions of threads, but fitting a million threads on the slide was hard, so we're going with four. Um, when it comes to SPIMD style programs or other programs that use what we call multiple instruction, multiple data, an example of what does that is a multi-core CPU. The advantage here is it's very general. You can exploit things like thread level parallelism. You can run each of those threads concurrently, but independently, because each of them might be a little further ahead or behind one another. Um, the con, though, is because they're not running concurrently, that means that things like data parallelism are probably not going to be exploited because we don't want to, we're not able to use the same data or the same instruction at the same time. That means each of these threads has to be able to fetch and decode something separate. SIMD, or vector instructions, like the RISC-V vectors you heard Bobby talk about last session. x86, of course, has similar support. The pro here, and this is uh, the way I like to think about it, is that you have one really thick thread because that thread might be operating on 128 or 256 bits or bytes you know, at a time, depending on what company and what vector extensions you're working on. The pro here is you can write that into your CPU code. So you can mix doing things in parallel with doing things in serial. But the downside is because we now have these instructions operating at a different granularity, we have to, what we do, what we call gather and scatter data and implementing those within the context of these CPU systems can be more complicated. And that's really where SIMT, which is what GPUs run, comes in. SIMT, if you will, kind of combines the ideas of the first two parts of this slide. It allows us to have many threads, like MIMD or SPIMD, but it also makes it so they're doing the same thing at the same time, like we're doing in SIMD or vectors. And this means that it's easier to program. We can have efficient support for things like scatter and gather because all the threads are gonna be doing the same thing at the same time. And the way I'm trying to show that they're doing the same thing at the same time are kind of those horizontal bars across those threads. What that's indicating is each one of them is like another instruction that all four threads are doing at that time. The downside, and you're gonna hear me talk about this uh, over the next, let's say, five slides, is that if those threads are no longer doing the same thing at the same time, which is what we call divergence, your performance is screwed. So you really gotta use programs that can take advantage of this paradigm for GPUs to perform efficiently. In reality, it means that GPUs, because we devote a lot more resources to doing things in parallel and having lots of memory accesses happening concurrently, they are optimized for streaming computations because you have lots and lots of memory accesses going through the memory subsystem at the same time. Uh, our main memory, our DRAM, our HBM, is gonna take hundreds of GPU cycles to do per memory access. Uh, and we have a challenge, just like we do in CPUs, that we need to figure out how to keep the GPU doing useful work while we're waiting hundreds of cycles for our data to come back. And it's instructive to think about how we try to do this with CPUs. Well, in CPUs, you know, solution number one to almost all problems is to cache it, right? We're not gonna spend the time going to main memory. Instead, we're gonna keep it in some local cache that's much faster, uh, and we're gonna exploit things like spatial or temporal locality. The problem here is because these workloads for GPUs are streaming, meaning that they're not really reusing data a lot, they don't have temporal or spatial locality. So caching in the way that a CPU does caching is not gonna help. Second option CPUs do is they're gonna exploit ILP. They're going to try and identify independent instructions within a thread that they can reorder to help hide that delay. 
turns out that GPUs don't have a lot of independent instructions to reorder, and implementing this kind of behavior is really, really power hungry. So that approach is out too. Might seem unfortunate because the two, you know, go-to techniques that we use in the CPU world are not going to work. But the third option that GPUs do, especially you know, since the late 90s, is they use something that we call simultaneous multi-threading or multi-threading. And the idea of that is you're going to let some threads run until they reach some long latency operation. And at that point, we're going to switch to another thread that has some work to do. And that turns out to work really well because we know GPUs have thousands or millions of threads. And if one thread is now doing this long latency operation to wait on memory, no big deal. I have another 999,999 threads. I'll find one of them that has useful work to do, and I'll start doing work with it until that other thread comes back. And so we use all of those threads running in parallel to help hide this delay. And what that means is we're going to design our architecture around that idea. And we're going to group those millions of threads into subgroups that we're going to run on what I'm going to call a GPU core. You'll see me use core in quotes for the next few slides, and I'll explain why when we get there. But the short answer is cores in the CPU world and in the GPU world do not mean the same thing. So logically, you can think of it like a CPU core, but practically, they behave differently. So the loose analogy here is that one group of SIMT threads is approximately equal to one SIMT thread that, sorry, SMT thread that you'd be running on a CPU. And what I mean by that is, let's say your CPU well, that has four cores where each of them can run two threads. That means you can be running eight threads concurrently on your CPU. Any one of those eight threads is logically equivalent to one group of threads that we're going to run on the GPU. A key difference, though, is in GPUs, we actually expose this to the programmer. And now, given that we've broken up those threads, and you can see we have different groups of threads running on multiple GPU cores concurrently, we are on a single one of them. We're going to switch between those thread groups at a per cycle basis. So if and when one of those groups of threads starts issuing long latency operations and it doesn't have any work to do until it comes back, we switch to another group of threads and we start running that. So you can imagine, while I've only drawn two groups of threads per GPU core here, we really probably want a lot more than that running per GPU core to exploit sufficient parallelism to hide these delays. OK, so now let's start assigning names from these components that we have that I've talked about on the past few slides to what pro uh, prominent GPU programming languages like CUDA, OpenCL, and HIP refer to these things. So a single thread within those SIMT, CUDA and HIP, are calling a thread. OpenCL calls a work item. One single group of SIMT threads, CUDA and HIP call a warp. OpenCL calls a wavefront. Multiple groups of threads that logically we have run together. CUDA and HIP will call those a thread block or a CTA. OpenCL calls it a work group. Uh, and then finally, all of those groups of threads running across all of the cores concurrently, we'll call that a grid running a kernel or an ND range running a kernel. So when you hear people talking in the GPU world about thread blocks or work groups or wave fronts or warps, what they're really doing is they're taking those abstract concepts we've talked about thus far and they're mapping them into the you know, architecture specific documentation or references. Now you heard me on the last slide talk about these three programming languages, so it's only fair that I explain a little bit about them. CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. It is NVIDIA's GPU programming language. Uh, HIP is, stands for Heterogeneous Interface for Portability. It is AMD's equivalent to CUDA um, in its successor to OpenCL. OpenCL is actually partially supported inside HIP. And in case you're wondering what OpenCL is, it stands for Open Compute or Open Computing Language. And this is an open industry-wide standard that's technically run by Apple. Um, all of them, though, at a high level, what they are is they're extensions to C and C++ to allow us to you know, run C, C++ style code with vector extensions to run lots and lots of threads concurrently in them. 
And what they're doing is they're performing a, sh a task, a shader task, or a snippet of some sort of computation across many elements. Uh, and internally, it's going to use things that you heard me talk about, like scatter and gather and vector mask operations to account for the fact that not every thread might actually want to do the same thing at a given time. And we also have other solutions, uh, if you're interested, like OpenACC and C++ AMP. They are not as popular today, but they are around if you're interested. Now, what does all this mean? Well, what in practice it means to program a GPU is that you're going to be offloading some piece of work that you would like the GPU to do, say some highly parallel part of the pro program, from the CPU. And so that means you're gonna have this rhythmic way of writing programs where the CPU will run for a while and then it will spawn some work and pass it off to the GPU. When it's done, the GPU will come back to the CPU. The CPU will do some more work, spawn another piece of work off to the, on the GPU and so on and so forth. And each time we're spawning work and passing it off to the GPU, we need to transfer the data it needs and we need to spawn however many threads it needs. And then of course, when we're done, we have to transfer the data we want back. Um, and each of those phases of work that we're offloading to the GPU are what we call a kernel. So you heard me mention that on the previous slide. Each yellow box here is a different kernel or a different phase of our program that is amenable to running on a GPU. Okay, so GPU, remember we have a bunch of those logical cores that I told you I'd put in quotes and I'd come back to. Let's talk about that now. So each of those cores, remember, is running many groups of SIMT threads concurrently. And in reality, what a GPU does is it will have multiple levels of memory, starting with uh, GDDR or HBM, some levels of cache, including, say, a shared L2 cache across all of those compute units or cores. Um, and then locally, within each one of those, we'll have some L1 cache that, run, that is used by multiple SIMT ALUs. And these are ALUs, excuse me, designed to run on very wide vectors. And you can see in this picture, we actually have four of them that's running on a given one of those GPU cores. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of registers and local memory and other things to help us do those computations. So let's talk about each of those pieces one by one. So the reason why I called it a GPU core in quotes is naturally it's doing something very different than a CPU core. And, that, and that's why GPUs call it a compute unit, or NVIDIA calls it a streaming multiprocessor, or SM. Regardless of which uh, terminology you want to use, what its job is, is its job to run those thread blocks or work groups in parallel on its underlying hardware. And in the, I mentioned on the previous slide, but it will do this using multiple SIMD units, and every cycle will schedule something to run on each one of those SIMT units, assuming we have enough work. And the SIMT unit's job will be to run a wavefront or a warp. And so it will take the threads within that wavefront or warp and run the threads. How big these are is going to depend on the architecture. To give an example from AMD, the size, say 10, of the buffer that we're holding to execute instructions um, will assume that, say, it takes four cycles to execute a wavefront with the goal that we fetch and commit one wavefront per cycle through these SIMT units. Second key thing here is something we call address coalescing. And what address coalescing is, is it means, because remember, all of our threads want to do the same instruction, but they're going to access different data. And so when we run those waves or we run those warps in the GPU, we're going to issue a whole bunch of memory requests, right? Remember, we have millions of threads or thousands of threads if all of them are trying to issue a memory request concurrently, we're gonna overwhelm the memory system, no matter, how, no matter how hard we try. But we're gonna exploit some key piece of insight here, which is that, generally speaking, threads that are in the same wavefront or in the same warp are gonna access data that's nearby. Ideally, they're gonna access data that is directly one next to each another over and over and over. And so we could make a request that brings in that cache line and it'll satisfy all, or hopefully all, of the requests that my warp or my wavefront will make. So I really only need to issue, say, one memory request instead of issuing 32 or 64, or however many I want to do in parallel. Of course, that is not always the case, as I'll show on the very next slide. And if that's not the case, we have what we call divergence. 
And that means instead of being able to take all of those requests and compact them down into one memory request, you had to issue more than one. Uh, and of course, the more requests you issue, the worse your performance, the more bandwidth you need to, to satisfy them. And this process is what we call coalescing. So the co job of the coalescer is to merge as many thread requests as possible from my warp or from my wavefront into a single cache block request. And what this does is it greatly reduces the number of in-flight memory requests, which help us save our bandwidth for the DRAM, for the things that actually need it. And it's very important to get good performance, which I'll show in an example here. So let's say I have some pseudocode that we're trying to do an add on the GPU, where I'm passing in three arrays, A, B, and C. They're all integers. And then my code is saying at each th thread ID, access A at that th index, B at that index, add them together, and then store it in C. Hopefully, what you can see from this is if I'm thread zero, I'm accessing A of zero, B of zero, C of zero. If I'm thread one, A of one, B of one, C of one. If I'm thread 300, 300, 300, 300. So I'm going to be accessing things perfectly one after another in this array. And so I can use the coalescer, which in this case we're going to show is sitting next to the L1 cache, and that allows me to issue one request where I'm accessing, say, 32 elements that are each four bytes apart, and I want all of that data as one big request. Of course, if my cache lines are smaller, then I need a couple requests to get enough cache lines. But the key point here is that in code like this, it is perfectly coalesced. We can, ac we can smash them down or coalesce them into as small a number of memory requests as possible, given the cache line size. In our, in our hardware. So, same thing I said there, but we issue one access for n to n times, n plus 16 times four, let's say, if you have 16 lines per cache, instead of 16, sorry, 16 words per cache. Conversely, if we have divergence, let's say we have some code like this, where array A, you actually access TID time, thread ID times two for each thread. Well, now what that means for array A is I access A with an offset of zero, A with an offset of eight, A with an offset of 16, and so on and so forth. So now, to access 16 elements, I actually need to generate two memory requests because I'm accessing, logically, data that is further apart. And also, I'm only accessing every other word on the cache line. So, of course, this is a contrived example, but you can imagine Real code does exactly this. And so finding ways to write your code where you don't need to access elements that are far apart will be much better for performance. And we use hardware in the coalescer that dynamically inspects what addresses your threads are accessing and then generates as few of requests as possible to do so. And so that's what the coalescer here is doing. It will inspect all the lanes or all the threads that your GPU is sending out a memory request for and say, okay, these n threads, they need one cache memory request, n memory request, or anywhere in between. Okay. So the other key part of our GPU pipeline is the SIMT unit. You can think of this be, like being a very wide CPU pipeline. But the difference here is that instead of fetching many instructions and passing them through the pipeline, all of these SIMT uh, units are actually operating on the same instruction concurrently. I just realized that the blue on my slide is not nearly as blue for all of you. Sorry about that. Uh, but the idea here, let's say here we have 16 ALUs. That means each of those ALUs can be operating on some piece of data in parallel. They each have some piece of the register file to help keep them satisfied to read the data in and pass it through. Um, and if they need to go and say do a loader store, that's when we're going to use the address coalescing unit from the previous slide. Now, you might be wondering, does it have to be 16? It does not have to be 16. That is specific to the microarchitecture for AMD that we support in Gem 5. NVIDIA, for example, nowadays, I'm pretty sure they have 32 wide ALUs, so you can imagine this picture being doubled, and that would roughly be what NVIDIA GPUs look like. 
But the key point that you hopefully take from this is, A, we have a lot of ALUs, like way more than we had in a CPU, even in an out-of-order CPU. And two, we have to have a lot of registers to keep all of them satisfied, because I'm trying to do 16 things concurrently. So that means the register file is going to be like four, sorry, 64 times bigger given unit of area, uh, sorry, given uh, core than it would be on a CPU. And also, I'm going to let multiple groups of these run in parallel on a given compute unit. In fact, you might recall that I said that we have 32 or 64 threads that are concurrently in a wave or a warp. What that means is, well, if I only have 16 LUs, I need four SIMD units, each of which looks like the picture shown here, to actually run all of the threads from that wave front concurrently on a GPU. So within a compute unit, we don't just have one SIMT unit like this. We'll have four, like I showed on the previous slide, and that allows us to get the level of parallelism we need to get good performance. OK, so now that we've talked briefly about the GPU core, let's talk about the memory that's feeding it. While caches making bigger and you know, uh, more associative and so on, caches are not the solution for GPUs. They still do use caches. So you might be wondering, well, you just told me we're going to have 32 or 64 threads that are going to be concurrently generating memory requests. Does that mean I need 32 ports on my L1 cache? Uh, well, hopefully, uh, I don't know how far everybody is, but hopefully when you took your architecture course, you learned that we don't have 32 port caches. That's not super practical. So that's a, that's a non-starter. We can't even use techniques like banking to practically solve it. Second, you might wonder, well, do those 32 cache misses cause 32 requests to memory? And by the way, that's only assuming the NVIDIA numbers. AMD uses 64. So like I said, the common case is that we're going to coalesce down using address coalescing to get around this problem. I guess I flipped those two slides. Sorry. One last thing about the core. Increasingly in recent years, what AMD and NVIDIA have been observing is that there's applications like machine learning that don't really need the full precision of those ALUs that we just discussed on the previous slide. Uh, and also, they observed that these applications are frequently doing things like fused multiply add, multi matrix multiplication operations, or dot products, and so on, uh, frequently in the work they're doing. And so this observation led them, starting in about 2018, to add specialized ALUs beyond what I talked about in the previous few slides to their compute units or to their SMs if you're NVIDIA. Um, and so starting with Volta, what, what NVIDIA did is they introduced FP16 support to do these kind of specialized operations. Later in Turing and Ampere and so on, they added less precision like 4 bits and 8 bits integer support as well, better sparsity support. But at a high level, what these, and, uh, and by the way, AMD with their MI100 through 300 parts, same kind of thing. Uh, but what it does is it provides a lot of flops that we can use for these very specialized operations because now we can have a single instruction that does, say, an entire dot product for some chunk of data. And the way that works is the warp scheduler will issue some uh, tensor core operation shown in purple on the right side where you can operate on, say, two 4x4x4 four by four by four tensors. So we can do you know, a dot product of all the data within that, for example. It won't take one cycle. It'll take some small number of cycles, but as a single instruction. So we put specialized hardware in to improve these kinds of operations that we're running. NVIDIA calls these tensor cores. AMD calls them matrix core engines. But we'll see some examples in the second half of how to use that. Um, Last thing I want to say here before we get on to how we actually do all this uh, and, and address your question. You heard me mention a couple times that we don't use caches in the same way in CPUs and GPUs. And I think it's instructive to think about modern cache sizes for the CPU and the GPU. For example, an L1 data cache in the CPU is about 64 KB. GPU is 16 to 32 KB. Um, but the number of threads or the number of work items that are sharing that is hugely different. On a CPU, Intel and AMD, for example, and ARM for that matter, you have two threads that are sharing those 64 KB. So that means each thread gets 32 KB, roughly, to itself. 
In the GPU, you have something like 2,560 threads that are running concurrently on my compute unit. And that means that each one of those threads gets a, a, a whopping 6.4 bytes to store in the cache. Don't spend it all in one place. And if we go to the last level cache, the same thing is true. CPUs, we have, say, eight megabyte last level caches, although those are getting bigger. Uh, in a couple of recent parts, they're now up to maybe like one gigabyte in a couple of cases I've heard. GPU, they're like four megabytes, maybe a little bit bigger now. But again, the scale of threads that are sharing that space is way different. In the CPU, if we have eight cores, that means that we have 16 threads, two per core running. You get a half a megabyte in the LLC. In the GPU, if we have, say, 32 compute units, I think uh, is how I did this number, you have 163,840 threads that are sharing that space. So you get 25.6 bytes for your thread to cache. Again, you know, that's, that's not even like a fraction of a cache line that you get to keep. So what that means is, just frankly, the, one of the reasons why we don't use caches in the way that we do in the CPUs is we just can't, right? We're running too many things concurrently that we just cannot keep things around in the caches in the way that we traditionally do in the CPUs. So instead, because GPUs are designed to maximize throughput, not latency, and because they're not really gonna have any locality to exploit anyways, because we only get six bytes of cache per thread, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have our goal be in the L1 cache that we want to keep the data around in the cache long enough for all of the threads in my warp or my wavefront to access it once. So not like n times like a CPU. We just want all 32 or 64 of those threads to get the data they need one time before somebody else kicks it out and needs their 6.4 bytes. And by doing so, and especially by exploiting coalescing, that allows us to reduce the number of requests that we send to DRAM. And then last level cache in the GPU tends to be an L2. Its goal is basically to act as a staging buffer with a little bit of reuse for things like instructions, um, with the goal being to tolerate spikes in DRAM bandwidth. But not all is lost here. GPUs also add specialized memories, things like scratch pads and textures, that allow them to exploit things like spatial and temporal locality in these specialized memories where the programmer controls what goes in there, for example, with scratch pads. Okay, so now this is, these are two sides are gonna hopefully start to address your question. There are two common flavors of GPU, and we're gonna talk about both of them in the examples uh, coming up here, but before we do, I think I need to tell you what they are. The first one is what's called an accelerated processing unit, or APU. And the idea here is that an APU has CPUs and GPUs living, coexisting in a single unified address space with coherent caches and a single set of virtual memory. So that means if you access address A on the CPU, you access the exact same address A on the GPU. So you don't actually need to copy data back and forth between the CPU and the GPU in this case which might sound nice, for example, for programming if you don't have to put in a bunch of extra copies. Um, and what that looks like in practice, let's say we have the picture down here, the GPU on the left, CPU on the right, maybe we have two CPU cores with some levels of cache, maybe we share an iCache between them. GPUs, let's say we have four compute units. Uh, I, before I go on, I should explain. NVIDIA, sorry, AMD, uh, for whatever reason, they use weird names for their caches for the GPU. SQC is an L1 iCache. TCP is an L1 data cache. TCC is the unified L2 cache. I don't remember what any of those acronyms stand for, but that's what they mean. Um, but you can see here that we're sharing the iCache across, say, groups of four compute units, and then each of those compute units get a separate L1 data cache, and then they share a single unified L2 cache for both the I and D cache. They also have a second specialized type of cache called a scalar cache. And the idea of the scalar cache is sometimes when I'm doing these vector operations, I wanna do something like multiply every thread by the same bias term. Say when I'm doing matrix multiplication operations, sometimes I just wanna normalize all of that data to be on a zero, one scale. So I wanna multiply everything by some number, 
to do that normalization. Well, it doesn't really make sense for all of those threads to bring in the exact same number, say 32 times, to multiply that. That takes up a lot of register space, maybe a lot of memory space. So we have this separate specialized scalar path that allows us to bring it in once and then use it across all of the threads in our warp or wavefront. Now, and this comes to the, the question before, beyond this point, so both the, uh, the CPU and the GPU, they have two levels of cache. Because they're using a single unified address space, they have a directory beyond there that will connect them. So that allows us to tr access data back and forth between the CPU and the GPU under the hood without the programmer needing to be involved. And then that will connect to the memory controller and then finally in the memory. So to come back to your question from before now, in an APU system, there is only one system memory. There isn't a separate GPU memory and CPU memory. And that absolutely will play a role when it comes to what are we keeping around. That is in contrast to a DGPU or a discrete GPU. So in a discrete GPU, we have separate discrete address spaces for the CPU and the GPU. And all of these things that are in purple here are the things that we need to do for the GPU to implement its own memory. So it does virtual memory, it has DMA engines or SDMAs, it has packet processors, it has interrupt handlers, a whole host of other things that allow it to essentially behave discreetly through interfaces like PCIe, NVLink, or XGMI. And we then, in this case, do have to copy data back and forth between the CPU and the GPU across the PCIe or other connection to access it. But, and this is the other half of your question, in this case, we have a separate memory for the GPU and the CPU. And so the bandwidth can be different in this case. So if you wanted to know what it looks like when Gem5 is running an application, this is what it looks like. You have some application shown in the top left in gray. It might go through multiple levels of user libraries, say, for AMD GPUs, RockBloss is their high-performance BLOSS library that does things like gems. And underneath it, it uses Tensile, which generates like handwritten, you know, high, high optimized performance assembly code for things like gems that RockBloss uses. Those library calls in your program will be part of a HIP program shown in the middle top. And then that will generate Vega code along with metadata, which will be passed into the simulator. And on the user space side, it will go through those a number of libraries as well as Rock R and Rock K, which are part of AMD's uh, driver stack for the GPU that I'll talk about on the next slide. And on the OS side, it will go through Rock K, which is basically the equivalent of the Linux kernel in that driver stack. But what happens under the hood here is you take all of that information, all of the different levels of software, all the way from your application program down through the, you know, the Linux kernel equivalent, and you pass it into this yellow box shown on the bottom right, which has our x86 cores, just uh, as an FYI. Right now, Gem5 only supports GPUs with x86 cores because that's what AMD uh, GPUs run. <laughs> um, I know there was a, a researcher at Oak Ridge who got it to work with ARM CPUs, but I don't know if that ever saw the light of day. So in theory, it's possible, but uh, not encouraged. <laughs> um, but that code will then be passed into the memory, into the CPU, x86 cores, and then into the GPU, where we have our compute units shown in purple, and this other box called a CP, or a command processor, which a few of you were asking me about during the break. I'll talk about the command processor in like five more slides, but for now what you need to know is that it's basically the interface between the CPU and the GPU. So when I offload work from the CPU to the GPU, like we talked about earlier, what's really happening is I'm sending the CP something and saying, hey, I have some work that I'd like the GPU to do, take care of it from here. And the CP takes it and then actually offloads that work to run on the GPU. So that's what it looks like when we're running, when we're running uh, a GPU application. And Gem5 will run or model all of this. So let's get into the details. For AMD GPUs, they have an open source stack, which for research can be really good. For example, in my group, we've done a bunch of work hacking 
those drivers to add in a variety of features that allow us to model things that the drivers don't support by default. Of course, it's not for the uh, faint of heart. You gotta, you gotta you know, have some experience with operating systems. You know, going in and, and just trying to change things is gonna take some time. Uh, but it stands for Radeon Open Compute. And it supports all of those layers of software you just saw it on the previous slide. The runtime layer is what they call Rock R. Thunk is their user space driver, and that's what Rock T stands for. At the kernel level, they have what they call the kernel fusion driver, or KFD, which is called Rock K. Rock K has actually now been integrated into Linux, so it is uh, at some level now just part of Linux. <laughs> uh, and then at the higher level, you have things like MIOpen, which is their ML library. They have BLOS libraries like Rock BLOS, and then we have HIP, which is their GPU programming language. Roughly speaking, for those of you interested in compilers, what HIP is, is it's an LLVM backend and a Clang frontend. So again, that means because everything is in LLVM, if you are so inclined, you could go and make changes to you know, LLVM and have it run on you know, real AMD GPUs. And in SE mode in Gem5, the GPU support will simulate all of these layers except for Rock K, which it will emulate through Docker. And then in FS mode, our disk image actually contains the entire Rockham stack, so that means we simulate all of it, including you know, command, system command calls. Sorry, syscalls. Um, so, so that's roughly the kind of libraries that are required. Let's talk then about where this code is located. I realize there is a number of links here, uh, and I forgot to mention at the beginning that some of you brought it up during break. These slides are also posted in the code space, so if you want a PDF of it, you can get it there. Um, right now, if you want to look at the ISA we support, you heard Jason mention this this morning, that is the Vega ISA. The GPU core, so that's all that stuff we talked about thus far, is in the GPU compute folder. You'll see all the ALUs, the registers, everything there. The memory, some of you were asking me during the break about cache coherence and memory consistency. Those go in mem protocol and mem Ruby. And this is where all of the Ruby-based coherence protocols like Viper that you heard Jason talk about this morning are. Uh, HSA and Rockham go in dev HSA and dev AMD GPU. And then finally, on the config side, we have ex configurations for SE mode and FS mode uh, inside the configs folder. And I just want to point out some of these files are specifically used in FS mode and some of them are in both. Okay, so I alluded to this when I talked about what your code actually looks like when it runs in Gem 5, but in practice what happens is if you want to offload some piece of work to the GPU, what happens is the user space software will talk to the GPU using ioctals, and this is where Rock K comes in. Again, we emulate that in SE mode, we simulate it in FS mode, but it's going to use that command processor front end to offload your kernel to the GPU. The command processor, high level, has two pieces. It has a packet processor, because when the CPU is offloading work to the GPU, it will send it a packet and say, hey, here's a packet of work I'd like you to do. Here's all the information, you know, how many threads it has, where the code object is, uh, you know, how much uh, scratch pad do I need, et cetera. And then the GPU, sorry, the CPU will take that and it will start breaking it up, looking at how many threads per work group and, uh, there are and start dispatching it to the underlying compute units. Before it does that though, what we need to do is we need the runtime to create some queues that we're going to offload this work from the GPU, sorry, the CPU to the GPU on. So we will create, you can have up to 64K software queues in HIP and the HSA packet processor will map those to some smaller number like 32, 64, 128 of underlying queues uh, so you're going to be time multiplexing your software queues onto those hardware queues. Um, and so what that means, if you get a new packet of work that you're offloading from the CPU, you'll look at where the head and the tail pointer are for your queue, and you will add it to wherever tail is, assuming there's space. And that's what the CPU does then. It will go and inspect every time it's ready to do a piece of work. It'll look at the head pointer, inspect that packet, figure out what work it wants the GPU to do and what resources it needs, and then send it to the underlying GPU. Uh, and I have a few pointers here which I'm just gonna skip through quick, but 
if you do want to go and look at this code in Gem 5, these are the places to actually look at these different features. I think I'm going to skip this because these came up in the questions before. Execution pipeline. So we have roughly five pipeline stages. There's actually more in a real GPU, but in Gem 5, this is how we model it. Fetch is where we fetch the work groups that, we, sorry, the wave fronts that we've dispatched to the GPU, which are implemented in the fetch stage and fetch unit code. Scoreboard is going to check which wave fronts are ready. Schedule is going to select the, the wave front from the, the ones that are ready. So remember we said every cycle, this was your question before, like how are we keeping track of everything that's going on? Schedule and scoreboard are, are keeping track of all of that information. And they're going to inspect in a given cycle and say, okay, is Wavefront 0 got any work ready to go? Wavefront 1, et cetera. And whatever one has work ready to go, it grabs those and it starts sending that work out to the later stages in the pipeline. Execute being the most prominent of those, of course, that's when we actually execute like an ALU operation, say. And then the memory pipeline will, depending on what kind of operation we're doing, either do a local memory operation, a global memory operation, or a scalar memory operation, depending on what we're trying to do. Any questions about that? Okay. So last but not least, before we spend the rest of the time doing the examples, what is supported in Gem5 today? So we support two versions of Rockham well, we actually support more, but officially we support two versions of Rockham. In FS mode, we support the latest version of Rockham, which is 6.1. In SE mode, we support version 4.0. Uh, and we support a number of GPUs. They're AMD's Vega class GPUs. For the discrete GPUs, GFX 900. For APUs, GFX 902. Uh, and then we support their latest MI200 and 300 GPUs, which uh, I know a couple of you were asking during the break, but like these are the GPUs that are going in the supercomputers that the national labs, for example, are buying. So these are you know, very, very state-of-the-art uh, GPUs. Uh, and so it, you, our MI and 200 and 300 models go with uh, GFX 90A and 942. Just as a quick aside, um, if you're wondering what 900, 902, 90A, 942, all of that means, that is, again, a, a marketing thing. Um, so the first, the first three letters, GFX, stand for the graphics, uh, I forget what the other F and X stand for, but it's like graphics functionality execution or something like that. So basically it's telling you what, you know, that it's intended for an AMD GPU. The first number, the nine, tells you that this is generation nine of their GFX support. And then the last two numbers are telling you the specific part within that generation. So 900 means basically the first version of GFX nine, 902, third version, and then you can see we get up to increasingly large and absurd numbers from there. But what they're telling you is they're telling you something about the generation of the part that we're running within that ISA. And so you can imagine we, uh, we could run, say, GFX 8 or GFX 10 or whatever generation of code they have, and the numbers would then change accordingly. But anyways, in the MI and 200 and 300 models, we support these matrix core engines, these tensor cores, but we use a Vega-like ISA. Uh, if you were to pick this up and start using the GPU models today, we test the MI200 model a lot better than we test the MI300 model today because it's so new. It just came out like three weeks ago. Um, so I would encourage you to start with MI200 like we're going to do in our examples today, um, just because that is much more likely to support what you want it to support. Um, and then if you want to run a given application, like we'll see in a couple more slides here, you have to compile that code for the appropriate GFX 9XX number you see here. So for example, if you want to run your code on the MI200 model, you need to compile that code for GFX 90A. If you want to run it on the MI300 model, you have to compile it for GFX 942, and so on. So you, if you do not compile it for the right architecture, it will fail. Uh, in a minute here when I start showing demos, I'll actually show you what happens when it fails. Uh, there's a very common tell uh, that you didn't compile it for the right code generation, but I will uh, show you how to do that. Um, and then, yes, uh, one more important thing here. Uh, you've been learning good coding practices all week thus far from Jason and Bobby and Mayar and so on. Uh, 
Uh, we do not support the standard library with the GPU code yet, uh, and it currently only supports Ruby. So I'm going to teach you how we do that support, but eventually we will get that into the, the standard library. So that means we're going to be using APU SE.py, MI200, and MI300.py for testing instead. And then last but not least, uh, I would strongly encourage you, if you're starting new research and you don't want to do research on APUs, that you use GPUFS instead of the SE mode support. The reason why, one of the reasons we went to adding this FS mode support is the folks at AMD and other companies as well are constantly updating their software stack. And every time they would release a new version of software, in SE mode, we would actually have to go and implement all of the system calls needed to model that support, which I probably don't have to tell you, but I will, goes a lot slower for us than it does for the real developers. And so it was just a never-ending race to try and keep up with them. And what we found by going to GPFS, because now we have the entire Rockham stack and we simulate all of that, it allows us to keep up to date with these latest and greatest versions of Rockham in a much uh, less painful way. So if you need APUs, that support is there, and I'll show you how to use it. But if you're picking this up and your goal is to start doing research tomorrow, I would encourage you to use the GPFS support unless you need something that's not there, that's not supported, like APUs. Uh, you heard me mention this a few more times uh, already about FS mode and, and APUs and GPUs and so on, but just to drive the point home, SE mode is what we use to simulate APUs. GPUFS is what we use to simulate DGPUs today. And as of Gem 5 24.0, which I know Bobby left the room, but I think that means like as of like you know 20 days ago or so, roughly, um, the we only support the x86 KVM CPU and Atomic CPU with uh, GPUFS. And what that means is you need to have when using the KVM CPU. The host machine must be x86 with KV and have KVM support. However, you will see uh, a flag in all of the demos that are coming up to disable that host requirement uh, in a moment. Um, we are working, similar to your question about multi-GPU, multi-chiplet devices, we're working on extending that support, but that's what's there today. Uh, the main difference, of course, is that we're simulating the entire Rockham stack, but because we're simulating the entire Rockham stack, that means all of those purple boxes you saw on that uh, DGPU slide for things like DMA engines and packet processors and GPU virtual memory and so on, all of those things are modeled in GPFS but are not there in GPFS because we're modeling an APU system that doesn't have them. Um, and you'll see this in some of the coming up examples, but because we can use KVM CPU, that allows us to actually fast forward through phases of the program that might be less important. Um, all of our resources, uh, including the ones that you're going to see today, are available in Gem5 resources. Uh, so we have a wide variety of GPU benchmarks, as well as documentation and so on, that talks about getting up and running with ML workloads, with HPC workloads, uh, you know, general purpose GPU workloads, and a whole host of other things. Um, but you heard me mention this at the beginning, because getting the AMD driver stack up and running in precisely the right way is challenging. We do all of this through Docker support. And we have different Dockers that go with the SE mode and the FS mode as shown here. Um, I am only the, gonna ha and the reason I had you do this Docker pull command at the bottom is because you need that in the code space. For the SE mode, uh, we don't have all the features we need for that in the code space, so I'm just gonna show you how that works. But in the, in the real world, once you go back to, to your places of employment and universities and so on, these are the places to start. If you don't pull the Docker, appropriate Docker, you will not have what you need to compile the applications. And if you don't have what you need to compile the applications, then running them is going to be challenging. Um, so bottom line today, don't need them because the code space has all the dependencies. But on your system at home, you will need these. Okay, so with that, the remaining hour and a half, we're gonna start going through some demos. Is there any last burning questions I can address about how Gem5 models GPUs, what's supported and not supported, uh, GPUs as a, as a concept, anything else I can address about that before we get into a much more interactive 
ladder, ladder session. Okay, you all are experts now, great. So what these demos are going to be, and like I said, Marco and I are going to circulate around the room and help people because invariably, uh, no matter how hard I tried to, to, to you know, uh, simplify these examples and make them easy to run, there'll always be something that doesn't quite work for folks. We will come around and help, uh, you know, as you get problems, just raise your hand. Um, I've also tried to put in on each of these slides how long you should expect the test to run, um, because otherwise you might be sitting there forever not realizing what's going to happen. But we're going to go through four types of examples, and each of them have, you know, different examples within. First, I'm going to show you how to run a simple program in GPU SE. Second, we're going to run a number of examples in FS in the code space. And then we're going to actually pivot to talking about running PyTorch in Gem5. So how do we run ML workloads? How do we create and restore checkpoints to make that go faster? The kind of things that I imagine probably all of you would want to do when you go back to the universities. OK. For the GPU SE test, we're going to be running this workload called Square. Square is kind of in the GPU world like our Hello World test. It's a very simple program that just does vector addition where every thread i just does a of i plus b of i equals c of i, which should look very similar to that coalescing example we talked about earlier. Uh, naturally, because it is perfectly coalesced, it's ideally suited to running on a GPU. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not going to work in the code space today. I had a, a miscommunication with the Davis folks and that part got deleted, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, but this part is the least exciting and easiest to run uh, at, uh, back at a university. So I'm going to go through the steps of how to do it. The, and just to be clear, you do not need to run these steps. I'm going to do it on my machine in a moment here. So, but if you wanted to run this uh, you know, on your machine, what you do is you'd pull the GPU SE Docker that supports Rockham 4.0. You would, of course, have cloned Gem5 and Gem5 resources. You would go to Gem5 resources, compile the Square application, which is what the second and third commands do. And then you would go to Gem5, and you would compile the Vega x86 uh, build in Gem5. Now, I have done all of these steps already, just to make the example go faster, because building Gem5, as you all know, will take like 15 minutes. But do folks have any questions about the preliminaries? Like, how do we get Square set up to run? OK, so with that then, well, that's no good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to SSH into one of my machines in my group. Um, and I'm going to show you how running square in SE mode with those preliminary steps uh, complete works. So before I get too far, just in this uh, folder, I've cloned Gem5 and Gem5 uh, resources. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this Docker command, because I've already built Gem5, and I've already made the application. Before I show you running that command, though, a few things I want to point out. So, A, you might have noticed we're running this in Docker. We're running this in Docker because that's where all the Rockham support we, ad we added is. Um, and we're specifically using version 24.0 because that's the latest version of the, Rocker, uh, of the Rockham Docker for SE mode. Second, because we're using this not standard library way of coding, we're going to specify the config file we want to run for SE mode, that is apusc.py. Third, you might have noticed we have this little minus n3 here. This is because the Rockham stack actually launches multiple processes to uh, run your program. And so if you don't tell Gem5 to have enough hardware thread context, it will live lock because it will be expecting a thread to give up its context, but that thread is waiting for another thread that's not yet running to provide it with context, so you have to launch enough threads to account for the processes uh, that will be running. And this is a very common thing, even in my group. Almost always the first thing I try, if it just seems like it's running forever, 
is I increase the number of threads just to see if that helps solve the problem or helps it make progress. Um, and then finally, at the end with minus C, we are going to pass in the path to our binary. So I'll go back quick, but our binary is in gem5 resources under the source GPU square bin folder. Uh, and I'm gonna, you might have noticed there's one, two fields I did not highlight, which are the ones between the minus C and the N3. Those are the, oop, there's a typo. Let me fix that. Those are the ones that are telling us what we're modeling in our system. And what I mean by that is, this should say DGPU, sorry about that. Um, we are telling it that we want our system to run a GFX 900 code, which remember is a discrete GPU. So we're gonna tell apuse.py we want it to model a discrete GPU, which is what the DGPU flag does. And then we're gonna tell it that we want it to run code for GFX 900, which is the corresponding discrete GPU part. So with all that uh, said, let me Let me copy this command in and run it, and we'll see what happens. So this is going to run now for, uh, if I remember correctly, a couple minutes. So we'll get the code space and everything set up while I'm, I'm chatting about that. But um, the, the point I also wanna make here as I show this example is without that GFX version flag. So remember I said you have to compile the code for the generation of GPU you wanna run on. If you pass it in the wrong version or if you don't specify it at all, you might see that the simulator throws an error uh, and it will basically say I couldn't find a compatible binary to run this version of the code. Uh, and whenever you see that error, which I'll show you uh, in a demo here in one moment, what that means is either you didn't compile it for the right thing which you can go and check the make file to see what you're compiling it for, or it means that you uh, did not specify on the command line or in your script what version of code to run for. So let's go back here. Um, I won't go through every line of code here because it probably looks similar to what you've seen in you know, prior demos, but at this point, it's essentially just running the CPU code. We haven't even gotten to the GPU code yet. But you can see as these prints go by that things like the command processor uh, or the GPU compute driver are printing various things, which means that we're getting to these commands that, uh, you know, that our program is using to model the GPU. Some of them, of course, are warnings, like you can see at the top of the screen, it's telling us that we are modeling a certain ioctal that Rockham wants to model. Um, it is not, basically in Gem5, we only modeled the ones that we actually needed for the applications to behave correctly. So there's some of these you can see that have been skipped. If you wanted to add some new feature that does need these specific supports, like mapping certain, you know, hard paid pin ping pages, which is this one, you can of course add that support. Well, this is gonna go on for a couple minutes, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep going here and talk a little bit about what we'll see when it is finished running so we can get to the more interactive demos. So once this finishes running, just like some of the other sessions you've had thus far this week, you'll see that we can look through the stats to see how an application behaves. However, the stats for the GPU are gonna be different than the stats for the CPU that you've been looking at thus far. Specifically, we're gonna have a bunch of GPU-specific stats. In particular, the most important one is the one I've highlighted on the screen, which is shader active ticks. What shader active ticks is telling us is literally how many ticks was this specific compute unit running for this program. So in this case, you can see that it was running for uh, you know, 1.1 billion ticks. Um, and what we'll do as we start working through our demos uh, here is we'll actually see what those stats show and you can see how the different uh, demos and different examples behave when we wanna see how they perform. In the meantime though, you can see now that our test finished. It says it passed at the bottom and it took uh, you know, 144 trillion ticks or whatever that is. Uh, 
So that means Square ran correctly and ran to completion. And if we were to go and look at the stats, we can look at shader active ticks. And we can see, in this case, this specific uh, CPU took uh, 10 million ticks. So different, different program running in this case. You can also see, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, but there's a whole host of other stats that are GPU specific. How many vector ALU instructions are running? How many are running per wave front? How many scalar instructions am I running? How many memory instructions am I running? What's the utilization of the ALUs? There's dozens of other stats, depending on the kind of work you're doing, that may be useful for you as you model the GPU. But before we go on to those examples, let's see what happens if we remove this flag. So remember, that flag was how we were telling the GPU that we wanted to run this GFX 900 program. Well, if we remove that and we run our program, you can see that it failed. Um, okay, let me also remove the DGPU flag just to drive the point home. So what's gonna happen now is we have not specified which version we wanted to run for this code, and the default in the configuration file was not necessarily set to the same thing. So it's gonna start simulating this program, but when it gets to the kernel, it's going to fail because it's going to find that the kernel was not compiled for GFX 900. And this is going to result in an error, which like I said, we'll say, could not find a compatible binary. And I'll, in a minute here, you'll see what that is, but that, whenever you see it again, is why when you're running GPU models, you need to make sure you're specifying the GFX version you want to run on and have it match what you compiled the code for. Okay, so while that's running, let me talk briefly about those other stats. For example, if you want to look at the GPU compute unit's uh, cache hits and misses, you can look at TCP controller I, where I is the compute unit number, and look at M demand hits and M demand misses under the L1 cache. For the L2, you can look at the TCC M demand hits and misses. For the scratch pads, or the LDS, as AMD calls it, you can look at the LDS bank conflicts, for example. You can look at how many accesses were coalesced using the coalesced accesses. So, uh, is it Sara is your name? I'm forgetting. You were asking, like, how do I know how many were getting coalesced? You can look at this stat, and it will tell you exactly how good it was at coalescing your program. I mentioned vector utilization before. Like I said, there's dozens of other ones that are not shown here, but these are some of the ones you may consider looking at in your program. Great, and so now you can see we got this error here, which says hip error no binary for GPU, couldn't find binary for current device. And what that's telling us is, hey, you compiled the code for something other than what I'm trying to run. So very common error that I just wanted to show you all while we were doing this. One last thing here, just like all the other models you've seen thus far this week, the GPU has a large number of parameters you can uh, change. For example, you can control how many compute units there are, what the latency of memory requests are, uh, requests and responses are, how big the register file is, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see these all in apuse.py. Uh, for example, if you wanted to run the exact same program but change the number of compute units, you could use the num compute units flag on the command line and say set it to 20. So there's a number of features here. I'm going to skip these because uh, I want to get to the interactive examples, but GPU viper.py, you heard Jason talk about that this morning. It likewise has a number of other ones you can set. Okay. So. GPFS, remember this is where we're supporting the most recent version of Rockham, Rockham 6.1, and we're fully simulating the entire Rockham stack. So our, our container here contains an installation of the Rockham software stack, and we're gonna use that to build the applications that we're gonna run in our GPFS simulation. There are two crucial parts of this. First, the disk image, and second, the Linux kernel. Um, as we've talked about at the beginning, this is where I was asking folks as I was coming around to make sure they had run dev container. So I just want to reiterate one more time, in Workspaces 2024, before we start running uh, these examples, uh, 
you should see a file called x86 Ubuntu GPU ML ISCA, and you should see a file called VM Linux GPU ML ISCA. Needless to say, though, while we pre-downloaded all of this into the code space, if you are running this back at you know, your university or your place of employment, you will need to have these downloaded uh, from Gem5 resources to run on your machine, or uh, it won't be able to find the resources it needs to run FS mode. All right, so now we're gonna take that exact same application, Square, that we ran in GPUSE, and we're gonna run it together in the code spaces on GPUFS. Now, one last thing, so uh, with Xiao Tang a couple days ago, all of you in theory should have built the M5 ops already. Does any, did anybody not build the M5 ops already? Okay, so the M5 ops, if you've done that all already, then these first two steps we can skip. So are you confident they've done that or do we, should we go through it? Again? Okay. So again, uh, I'm gonna go through it here, but just as a reminder, all of this is in uh, the readme file. So first things, first I'm gonna go to line 13 and I'm gonna go to gem5 util m5. And again, if you've done this already, you can skip this step, but we're going to run scans x86 out m5. And what that will do is it will build, the, if you've already had them built, you should see a message like this that says it's up to date. If you haven't built them already, you will see that it takes a little bit longer to go ahead and build this operation. Is there anybody who, you know, Jason, Bobby, myself, or Marco can help get the M5 ops running now, or does everybody have it going? Okay, well, I'm not seeing any hands and I'm seeing lots of thumbs up, so hopefully everybody's been able to run this step, but if not, raise your hand and Marco or Jason or Bobby can come and help you get the M5 ops built. So with that, now that we've built the M5 ops, and the reason why we needed the M5 ops built is because we actually use them in Square to delineate different regions of interest, we're gonna actually go and build Square to run in Rockham 6.1. So to do that, we'll take the command on line 20, where we're gonna go to our Gem5 resources, source GPU square. If we do an LS, you can see we have our readme, a make file, and square. We're going to copy the make file that I wrote in the materials. So that make file has some special flags set up for the tutorial. And then last but not least, on, excuse me, on line 22, we're gonna actually uh, use the Docker, which again, remember, because it's with FS mode, runs Rockham 6.1, and we are going to compile. Now, if you're like me, and you didn't run the Docker pull at the beginning and had to restart the, start the code space while I was talking, you will see that it is now pulling that GPFS image, which is gonna take a couple minutes. What that next step is, is we're going to now run Square in GPFS. I want to make a big distinction here from GPU SE though. Running GPFS does not require Docker because all of those libraries are part of the disk image. And that was why I was asking to make sure you had the disk image in that prior step. So we'll find this will be the moment of truth to figure out if, if you have it or not. Um, but because we're calling to the respective files in the disk image, you can just run this on the command line without any Docker. So we only needed the Docker to make the application. And likewise, we have already pre-built Vega for you, so you don't need to run scans. In the code space, it will be in user local bin gem5 Vega. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna, run it. you can see we're running it with a new config file this time. We're using mi200.py. Um, and we're still running Square, which we just compiled in the previous step. But now we have these new flags, disk image and kernel. So those are the two files that where I was asking you to run the con container if you didn't have it already. That is where the disk image and the kernel that go with Rockham 6.1 are coming from. Uh, and then last but not least, 
this no KVM perf flag. What that does is essentially it decouples you from requiring that your host machine have KVM support. So it doesn't try to update like KVM's hardware counters or anything like that, which since our dev container is not does not guarantee it has, we put that flag in. So we will CD to uh, workspaces 2024 and then run the command on line 31. And with any luck, you will see it now run square in FS mode. And so uh, I just mentioned all these, but um, this should now take a couple minutes to run, just like it did with SE. But let's take a look at what the output is. First of all, unlike SE mode, you might have noticed that FS mode unhelpfully does not print past to the screen. So you might be worried, like, you know, I'm running the exact same application. You just showed me that it passed. Why am I not seeing that it passed? And that's because it's going to write all of its output to m5out system.pc.com underscore one dot device. So if we open that file, we can now see that our test passed. So everything behaved as correct, but it does not print that output to the screen by default in FS mode. And in fact, it kind of has these, uh, you know, worrying prints at the end that are talking about like hacks to the total instructions and so on. But always check the system PC com output. That is the place to go to validate that things are behaving as expected. I know at least one or two of you folks are, are getting help to get to this point, but everybody else, you're able to get to this point and you can validate that it says it passed. Anybody else need help? Okay. So the last example we're gonna do before we take a quick break here then is we are going to actually run some tests that use MFMA uh, operations. MFMA operations are the tensor core or matrix core engine operations that run in AMD GPUs. So we have a number of commands here, but just to walk through the big picture of the commands, what we're going to do is we're going to copy the MFMA test that Marco uh, wrote up with me. Uh, we're going to compile it, then we're going to run it. I want to draw your attention to one thing here. You, it, with that minus D flag, we are directing the output to a folder called MFMA out one. Um, but otherwise, this should look very similar to what we just ran on the previous slide, right? We're using Gem5 Vega. We are using the mi200.py configuration script, same kernel, same disk image. Uh, now we're using the application, though, of this new test that we wrote, um, but otherwise the same. And what this test does, for those of you who are interested, is it's running a 32-bit floating point uh, matrix core engine or tensor core operation using LLVM intrinsics in Gem5. So let's take a look at that, just for those of you who are curious. In particular, the key point here is you can see uh, right here on line 85 of the code, we're using this built-in LLVM intrinsic that's telling the, the GPU that it wants to run an AMD GPU MFMA operation, which is 32-bit floating point and has 32 by 32 by 32 as the size that it wants, or sorry, by two as the size it wants to run on. So naturally, if you wanted to change this to run a different tensor core or matrix core engine operation, you could change this built into one of the other ones that are, you know, supported. With that being said, then, let's go through these steps. So, so these steps start on line 50 of the readme. I'm already in the workspace, it's 2024, so I'm going to skip that step. But I'm going to copy the provided uh, test from materials to Gem5 resources. I've already done that, so that's why it's complaining. 
Say again? I can't quite hear you, I'm sorry. Is there any quick notes for me to arrange your Uh I believe I already have it made, but yes, that's what I was checking. Thank you. Oh, you're right. I guess I I thought I'd done that. Thank you. Uh, okay, so if you're having the same problem as me, you can make the directory as so, and then the copy should work. Maybe not. Let's figure out what's up. I bet it's this. The dangers of live debugging, I guess. Okay, so we copy the files to that folder then. We now go to that folder. And once we're in that folder, we're now going to compile the application. So note in the make file this time, it's compiling to GFX 90A. Remember, GFX 90A is how we tell a GPU we want to generate code for MI200, which is the GPU we're running here. Um, and so that operation was successful. The next step then is to actually run this test, which is what line 57 is doing. But before I get there, what I, act what I want you all to do is we're gonna do some testing here. So remember, I said that the GPU model has a wide variety of different configuration operations. So what we're gonna do here with our MFMA test is we're actually gonna test what happens when we use some of the different register allocators that are supported for the GPU model. Specifically, we're going to use the simple register allocator model, which allows us to run one wavefront at a time on a given compute unit versus the dynamic one that lets us run, run as many as the resources allow at the same time. And that is what lines 57 and 50, excuse me, and 58 do. So I'm gonna start that running Last thing before I come around to help folks, the w place that you can use to check your output and see how these compare, the D flag is specifying different output folders for each of these two tests. So once you run them, you should be able to use them to check how the behavior of these different register allocators are performing with our matrix core engine test. Okay, then, yeah, this is the same problem he had. And then now this, did it work? Let's see. Okay, so assuming you ran both commands on 57 and 58, you should now have our MFMA out dyne and MFMA out simple output folders. If we look at those, you'll see that both of them have stats. And so what we can do, one simple way to do this if we want to see how the GPU behaves with each of these different approaches, is we can grep for shader active ticks in each of those files. And so hopefully you saw what, what I see, which is that if we run with the dynamic register file allocator, where we're letting more parallelism happen on a given compute unit at a time, it matters a lot for matrix core engines, right? Because we're no longer limiting a single wavefront from running at a time, so we get about half the runtime or double the performance for the same application. So, you know, I, I gave you this example not just to show how you can use different features in the GPU, but also to highlight how carefully considering those features and what you're trying to model can have a huge impact on the behavior you see for these kinds of programs, especially things that are very register hungry, like an MFMA. Uh, let's move on. So 
in the last part here, we are going to talk about, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, but yeah, each of those tests should take about 45 seconds. But in the last part here, we're going to talk about running these large-scale workloads. So how do we create checkpoints and restore from them? And then how do we run uh, ML workloads? Now, naturally, as you all probably know, ML workloads are really time-consuming, even running on real GPUs. So simulating them would take forever. Um, and so here, we're going to use checkpointing to run the most important parts that we care the most about. Um, and that means once you create a checkpoint, you can restore all subsequent simulations for the same app and input uh, for that given app from that point. So if you need to run this simulation many times, creating a checkpoint once can be well worth your while. Now, the way that that works, um, I'm gonna, uh, this works is you include some certain files. I'm not going to actually go through this in the demo, but this is just for people's benefit if they want to do it. You create, or sorry, include the gem5 m mapping files. Then you will make commands to the m5 op adder and map m5 mem. And then finally, after the part of code, or at the point you want to create the checkpoint, you call m5 checkpoint adder. Um, and that's how applications work. Now, in, um, in terms of how you update the make file to go with this, you need to make sure that you have M5 ops set up in your make file to create a checkpoint. We have already done this for you, so you should not need to do any of this, but you can always check, I guess, if you want that in square in your make file that you have these things updated already. But now we're gonna move straight on to creating the checkpoint. So let me that's going to start at line 61 in the script. I'm already in the Workspaces 2024 folder. And like I said, we can, before we start, we can check that we have uh, updated the makefile properly to include those M5 ops. And to do that, we can see that uh, line 6, we have our gem5 path set to where gem5 is. And then lines 8, 9, 10, and 11, we have set the appropriate M5 ops, just like you saw with Zhao Tong, to include that into our compilation. And then last but not least, line 16, we're including CXX flags and LD flags uh, in the command line to make sure we link the M5 ops in. Question? Okay, so since we know the make file's good to go, we're just gonna go straight to line 67 before, well, I'll kick it off, but then while it's running, I want to highlight a couple things. What, um, one sec, let me check something here. Okay, it looks like some of the commands in the readme got changed here, so I do apologize about that. Let me see if they went somewhere else. Okay, so I did skip a step, uh, or, or when I updated the readme, I updated them out of order, sorry about that. But the lines for this are broken up in the readme, lines 34 through, um, through 48 go with creating the checkpoint, and then again they pick up at line 61. So I apologize that that happened. But what we need to do to get this working is actually start with uh, start with line 37. So we're going to copy the version of Square that actually has this checkpointing code that I talked about on slide 61 here, where we put in checkpoint adder and the other commands for you. So you don't have to write that yourself. You can go ahead and run line 37 that will copy that file into gem5 resources square. Yeah, there's definitely some weird updates here in a couple places. I wonder if I messed it up. Sorry about that. Um, line 40, if it says MI300, that should be MI200. So I apologize uh, if you're seeing that. I thought I'd fix this all, so my apologies. Um, but we're going to copy this version of Square that has the checkpointing support into Gem5 resources. We'll copy MI200 into our Gem5 configs. We're going to make clean because we already built Square once. 
and then we're going to make with this new version. So I'm going to kill this command because I skipped ahead. And run through those same steps with you. That's not good. I see it. Oh, yeah, you're right. I don't know why that's there. Thank you. I'm not sure how these commands got corrupted, but I do apologize about that. Um, oh, I bet I know. Yeah. So all these commands where it says materials 2024, we're going to remove the 2024. And I wonder if that's the same reason folks were having a problem a minute ago with the MFMA example. So I do apologize for that. Uh, but we're copying the checkpointed square version into, into the resources. We're copying the updated MI200 script into our config files. Now we're going to go to gem5 resources. We're going to make clean because we need to get rid of that version we compiled to run uh, without checkpointing. And then finally, we will compile the version that does the checkpointing. And again, you can ignore these warnings. Um, anybody have any problems that they need Marco or I to help with to get to this point, or were folks able to make the application successfully? Okay, well, I'm seeing no hands, so I'm gonna assume that folks got through here. Um, and then what needs to be done, we're gonna go back to Workspaces 2024. And then finally, we're going to run the command that creates the checkpoint. One thing I want to draw your attention to while you're doing that, the thing that's changing here is we are passing in on the command line a new arg called checkpoint dir, which is how we're specifying the directory that we want to hold the checkpoint. And in that GPU CKPT folder, once it's done, you should see that it creates a file called m5cpt. And what that file, if you were to open it, would, look, would contain is it would have values for all the registers, for the TLB entries, the queues, the packet processor, the memory contents, basically everything you'd need to restart the state of the simulation at this point moving forward. Now, I've never tried it any other way, but in general, I would say you should only take checkpoints at kernel boundaries. I would not try to checkpoint inside a kernel. That next step, once it's done here, you should see that it said writing checkpoint, and then it says exiting at tick because checkpoint. And like I said, if we look in that folder, we can see that there is an m5.cpt file that uh, contains our checkpoint. So we can now go to line 72 of the readme, which is going to restore this checkpoint. So I'm going to kick that off while I explain what we're doing here. Basically, the command here is exactly the same as the ones we've been running in previous steps. You're using gem5vega. You might notice now I have a new directory called restore checkpoint. That's where our output stats are going to go. But otherwise, the only difference is at the very end, we have a new arg specifying the directory we want to use to restore the checkpoint, and that directory is called GPU CKPT, which is exactly the name that we specified on the previous slide. And like I said a couple slides ago, what's going to happen here is we're going to restore the state of the simulator to exactly the point that it was right after that line we added that does M5 checkpoint adder. And that restoration will include mapping all the memory back to the GPU, warming up the caches, setting the registers to the appropriate state, the queues, everything. Um, so that is going to be running now. And the last thing I want to say while that's running, for those of you who've gotten it done, 
what I encourage you to do is look at m5out.stats, which is going to be the original version of Square you ran with no checkpointing, and then look at your restoreckpt.stats, and those will allow you to compare the statistics for the various features and will allow you to, you know, test how the different, uh, you know, the behavior of the checkpointing should be. So, um, you know, in particular, I recommend that you check the last because that is the thing that we're restoring in the checkpoint. So you can check stats like shader active ticks or cache hits, things like that, to make sure they are behaving the same. So in my case, that finished running now. And if I were to check the stats, in this case, just to make sure we stay on task here, I'm just going to do shader active ticks. We can see that the original M5 out had uh, 732 million ticks, and the That's not good. Oh, okay. Somehow my command on the slides is not the same here, so I do apologize. Uh, but the the direct the output directory to specify was missing, which meant it overwrote M5 ops. <laughs> so I will run it one more time, but it's going to prevent me from showing the stats up here. Nonetheless, assuming you did not make the same mistake, you should see that the stats are basically identical for that kernel that we ran in both cases. And what that means is, since we're restoring and running the exact same kernels after that point, we would expect the behavior from that point on to be about the same, but we saved all of the time it took to run up to that point. So for example, if you look at sim seconds, which tells you how long the simulation took, you should see with the checkpoint restoration, it's much smaller. Okay. Uh, just show of hands, anybody need help restoring the checkpoint or were folks able to get to this point? I can pause here and Marco and I can come around and help if needed, but if folks are past this point, then we can spend the last 20 minutes doing PyTorch. So anybody need help? Okay. All right, so last but not least, as part of this support that we've been adding to the GPUFS mode, we are now have it so you can run workloads for frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow in Gem5's GPUFS support. Uh, and in the next few slides when we go through how to do this, I'm gonna assume you don't have any knowledge of what PyTorch is, and we're basically gonna be going through the quick start guide of PyTorch, but running it in Gem5. The quick start guide runs MNIST. Just, does anybody need me to explain what MNIST is, or do folks know what MNIST is already? The last 20 minutes, folks are like, ah, who cares? MNIST is a very nowadays simple, but in the 1980s, very famous machine learning workload that was designed to do things like digit re handwritten digit recognition. So did the user write a zero, a one, a two, up to a nine? Nowadays, you can do up to 100 uh, or more, but the, the quick start workload is checking handwritten digits. Uh, and so the disk image we provided you with already has the data sets for MNIST preloaded. Uh, and then that Gem5 PyTorch folder that we just fixed uh, during the lunch break that a couple of you brought up. Um, you don't need to run this clone. Instead, we have that in the repo for you. So, before we do that, I wanna highlight two features you can use with this support. I alluded to these uh, a couple hours ago, maybe at the beginning, but I think it's worth going in them in a little bit more detail. So when you're running these large-scale workloads in PyTorch, there's many, many layers of software, and there's lots of things to simulate, and we can't simulate all of it in high fidelity and be done in a reasonable amount of time. So we have some strategies to do things like fast-forwarding. For example, we have integration with uh, Gem5's KVM CPU, where we'll run portions of the workload on the CPU using KVM and other portions in the simulated GPU. This requires modifying the PyTorch code, which again, we've done for you in this case, but in the example, it will allow you to say, do training on the CPU, move the model to the GPU, and run inference on the GPU. 
We also have a second feature, which given the time, probably we won't get to today, but it's in the slides if folks want to try it, called skip to kernel, where we will skip simulating all the, f the timing details of specific GPU kernels. Um, and here where it means you won't get the right results, but if you aren't looking to get data results, you just want to you know, simulate certain kernels in detail, it allows you to get there much faster. Um, okay, so first things first, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to take the command that goes on line 78 in uh, the readme, and what that command's going to do, uh, it's slightly different because we made the fix during uh, the lunch break, but it's going to take the PyTorch test that's in materials 04 GPU model slash PyTorch, and it's going to run that with our same MI200 Gem5 model that we've been using in the last few steps. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and kick that off because it takes a few minutes to run. Uh, in, in my experience, it takes about three to five minutes. But what will be happening here now is we'll be taking that MNIST example that is provided in the PyTorch setup and is included in the materials and you can just run it directly from there. So again, Marco and I will come around and help folks if they might be having any problems with this, but in theory, you should now be able to run MNIST in our GPUFS mode. Get back here. So if we were to, again, um, look at the output directory here, look in PyTorch out, we can see that we have our system.pccom1 device. And we can see now that it ran the PyTorch test and we can see that it passed out, you know, an MNIST tensor with the values here, which we could go back into the PyTorch test and see what these correspond to, but basically these are the weights that it's suggesting that that PyTorch test will have. Now, I'm pretty sure by default that test randomizes the weights to start with, so if you see different weights, don't freak out. Uh, I'm pretty sure that is normal because it specifies randomization as the default behavior, but what that means is now with this setup, everybody's been able to run the PyTorch test in Gem5, which is, uh, you know, frankly something we couldn't do, you know, a couple months ago, right? So there's, it's a huge, you know, improvement, if you will, on the, on the behavior. And we can then go and see that it took, you know, like 0.7 uh, seconds or what, or sorry, milliseconds to simulate this time to run in the simulator and likewise we can go through and look at other stats if we want to see the behavior of the kernels in this MNIST workload. So MNIST is obviously uh, by far the simplest you know, uh, ML workload that we can run um, and we ran it in this very, very introductory basic test. So the last thing uh, I'm going to show today and then the rest I'll leave for folks to try on their own. Um, is we're going to talk about how we can run uh, the PyTorch version of MNIST. And there's three different versions of this. So this one will actually copy that train model to the GPU and run one single batch. Um, and then it will look at the loss function and so on. Now, uh, we won't have enough time today to run all of these, but we'll just run this very first one where we're running MNIST in our MI200 script and now this last part where it says Gem5 PyTorch will change, which hopefully is uh, already updated here, but let me check. Yes, it looks like it is. So this corresponds to line uh, 92 in the script. And so what this is actually gonna do now is it's gonna run that larger, not toy version of MNIST in Gem5 um, with the full batch of MNIST, and so you should be able to see the weights that come out with it then. Um, and so that's gonna take five to 10 minutes to run, so that'll be kind of where we end. I just wanna mention a couple things that I'm skipping, but you might find useful. So if you have files, like input files, you wanna run for your ML workload, there's well, slide 73 talks about how you can add them and then 74 does so for running NanoGPT, which is uh, one of the OpenAI uh, workloads that you know, powers ChatGPT and friends. Um, 
and then likewise uh, all that. And that's the last example, which we're not going to get to today. So just to, to summarize, and then I'll come around and help folks as they may be having problems with this MNIST command that's running. What we talked about today is we talked about a primer on what GPUs are, as well as how Gem5 models them. And we talked about how GPU software is supported in Gem5 in how we run both FS and SE mode applications. And in the latest support that we have, we now have the ability to do checkpointing in applications or even in these larger scale workloads, which I did not get to today. Um, but what that allows us to do is get to certain points in the application and then only run the key parts we care about every time we're simulating from then on. Um, and likewise, although I didn't draw too much attention to it, we can also offload kernels onto the CPU. Say if you don't want all that kernel, GPU kernel to be run at high fidelity, you can use offload features uh, to have it run on the CPU for, to make your simulator go faster. And then finally, we gave uh, a couple examples at the end that are still running that actually run PyTorch workloads in Gem5. So um, hopefully, I know, uh, you know there's a couple issues as we worked through, and I apologize if the commands got, got messed up there. But hopefully, you all found this useful. If you do decide to, to use GPFS, of course, uh, you know, you feel please do cite our paper. But more importantly, we are, as you heard me talk about a few times as the questions came up during the session, you know, we're working on adding you know, more applications, better resources, documentation, and so on to run these large-scale workloads in Gem5. So while well, we only talked about MNIST and then I, I skipped over NanoGPT today, um, you know, there are other ones that can run, but it would not shock me if you picked up some workload we've never tried running if there's some feature that it doesn't have out of the box that we would need to add to Gem5. So you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, you know, uh, the famous words, I guess, are if it's not being tested, it probably doesn't work. Um, and so that doesn't mean you should despair, but you can, of course, always ping us and uh, let us know. So with that, I will uh, wrap up here and then come around and help folks with the uh, MNIST example 